Uh, I love that song, and we're going to come back to that uh, kind of at the end uh, of, the, of the service. Um, but, but the bridge of that song says, Break my heart uh, for what breaks yours. Uh, and in Palm Sunday, it was very easy to see and recognize what broke uh, the heart of God. As Jesus would enter the city, as we read about, um, and he would go uh, preparing uh, to suffer, uh, preparing to die, really for one reason. And that was so that you and I, and that all people could have a relationship with God through him. Like that was what broke his heart. It broke his heart even, even to the point of death. And my prayer is, and, and my prayer always has been, that, that the church of God, the church of Jesus Christ, would stand up and, and begin to have their heart broken for the lost people that are in the world around them. For the lost friends and family members that we have, that our heart would not just feel pity for them, that would not just feel sorry for them, but that our heart would really break for those who don't know Jesus. Because I really do believe that Jesus makes everything better. So I just want to take a couple of surveys this morning, and, and I need you to participate with me. Um, and, and here at KCC, one of the things I like, we're just honest. So you can, you can be honest. Like, we already know you're jacked up. Um, I'm jacked up. Uh, so, so you can just be honest. How many of you have ever, ever have a difficult time obeying God? Only a couple liars in this service. That's not bad. That's not bad. Yeah, I, I do. I have a difficult time obeying God sometimes. And it's not always with, with what he's asking me to do. Um, it's because I have a problem with the why sometimes. I just don't understand why he's asking me to do that. Why, why in the world uh, would, would you want me to do that? So oftentimes I'll know that, hey, God wants me to go do this. And I'm like, why God? And he never tells me. He's just like, shut up and do what I tell you. And I'm like, I, I know what you want me to do. But why do you want me to do it? Sometimes it's just confusing to me. But occasionally I get it right. Uh, not very often, uh, but sometimes I do. I, I get it right. And I was thinking back to when I was 21, 22 years old, just starting preaching. I'd been in youth ministry for several years and uh, had moved to, to a church about 12 miles away from where I was the youth minister at. And would drive um, oftentimes just, just by this, these kids' house. Eric and Troy uh, Baker were their names. And every day, they were about six and eight at the time, every single day they were out there playing basketball. Like every day. And they would throw balls at my car as, as I drove by. Like they were little punks. And, and I love them. Uh, but, but they were, they were, they were uh, not very good kids. Um, and I just felt as I drive by every day, God just kind of saying, Josh, stop and play basketball with them. I'm like, I'm 22 years old. They're six and eight. I can dominate them. So I did. Like I would, like I would get out and, and we, we would, we'd lower the goal to about seven foot and I would dunk on these six and eight year olds. Like it was awesome. And day after day, like I would just stop and play ball with these kids. And they started coming to church. But I'm like, why? What, what good is it, is it going to do? I said, so they grew up and, and they became in the church. And Eric, the older one, uh, kind of uh, just went away, got uh, hooked up into drugs and, and a lot of alcohol problems and uh, left the church for a period. He's back now. Um, but Troy, uh, Troy um, became my youth minister for a time and, and we did some great things. And through that relationship, though, I also met two other brothers uh, who were, were about my age, um, Stephen and Troy Staggs. Uh, so it was two Troys. Um, and, and I came into contact with them because they uh, were, were both high school basketball stars um, and when, when they were in high school and they would coach uh, like the PTO Basketball League. So I'd go watch Eric and Troy play in the PTO Basketball League and I got to meet Stephen and uh, Troy Staggs and as I got to meet them and know them, um, I was able to share Jesus with them and brought them in, into the church and uh, today both of them are, are in churches preaching and leading people to Jesus. Why? Because I stopped and played basketball with some six and eight year olds unbelievable what, what God can do. Like I, I didn't have any idea that 20 years later that Troy would be in ministry and Stephen and Troy would both uh, be preaching and leading churches. Sometimes what God asks us to do doesn't make a lot of sense. Sometimes we don't get the why to what God's asking us to do. We just have to be obedient to what he's calling us to do. And we find that in our text 
uh, today. I'm in Matthew 21, uh, 1 through 3. It says this, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. Now I want to pause for a second. Because we as, as Christians, 2,000 years later, we read the Bible through that Christian lens. We, we know what happens already. Like they didn't know what was going to happen though. In fact, they, even, they were even confused about who Jesus was. They thought Jesus was still going to be a political messiah. They thought Jesus' purpose was that he was going to come and deliver them and free them from Roman oppression. They didn't know about the resurrection because it hadn't happened yet. So to them, Jesus was this really interesting guy, a political figure. Um, he, he'd walked on water. He'd healed some folks. They saw that. But right here in this text, he's asking them to commit grand theft donkey. He is, they, like they have no idea what's going on. He's like, hey, go steal the donkey. And if someone tell, asks you what you're doing, just tell them I want it. So let's imagine today after the service, we're standing out there. And I say to you, hey, I want you to go down to the nearest Chevy dealer and just grab the keys to a Corvette and bring it to me. And if they ask what you're doing, just say, hey, Josh needs it. How many of you? No, no one's going to do that. It doesn't make any sense. Can you imagine these disciples as Jesus is telling them what he wants them to do? Go get a donkey. Who owns the donkey? Don't matter. Go get a donkey. Well, do, I, do I need any money for the donkey? It don't matter. Just go take it. You know what's crazy though? They did it. They simply did what Jesus asked. Can you imagine the conversation they had on the way? Hey, I don't know if this is going to work. I don't either. I like the fish and chips thing that he did in Galilee. That was pretty cool. But I don't know if this donkey thing is going to work. But they took a small step of surrender and it led to a celebration in their entire city because they were willing to do something that, that probably that they didn't understand. And that's the first point today is listen, true success in life is the result of continual and complete surrender to Jesus. True success in life is the result of continual and complete surrender to Jesus. At the end of the day, my prayer for you and my prayer for me is that we would walk around in a constant state of surrender to Jesus. Like I'm telling you that that is the key to success. Like I didn't say an easy life because it will not be easy. In fact, as I look through the scripture, uh, God has never called anyone to do anything that was easy. But yet as Christians living in, in the United States, we think that all we need to do is wake up in the morning, say a prayer, God bless me, and that life is going to be easy. But what we see in the scripture is God told a guy like Abraham to, hey, you pack up, you take your family, you take everything you have, and you go to this place. What place? I ain't going to tell you, just go. We see God tell, tell Noah, hey, I want you to build this huge boat, and I want you to uh, to, to get two of every kind of animal. And I want you to take your family because it's going to rain. They hadn't seen rain before. Noah had to beat on a boat for 120 years before he ever saw the, the, the result of his obedience. David killing the, the giant, Goliath. In fact, even if we just look at these disciples who probably went and got the donkey, their life wasn't very easy after that. Every one of them would have been martyred for their faith. But yet every one of them would look back and say, that was a successful life. Every one of them would have looked back and said, you know what? I wouldn't change any of it. See, if you want God to do something new in your life, then you do something new in your life. You continually and completely surrender to Jesus. I'm kind of old school. I, I love hymns. Uh, they're, they're my favorite. I learned to play the guitar when I was about 18 years old. Uh, just so I could learn to play hymns. And one of the hymns that, that I love is, I Surrender All. I, I Surrender All. I, I love to sing that song. 
But sometimes when we sing it, it's more like, I surrender all, except for the fact that I looked at porn last night. I surrender all, except for the fact that I cheat on my taxes. I surrender all except for the fact that I'm not going to forgive that person. And it's not really I surrender all. It's I surrender some. God, I'm willing to give you some of me. I'm willing to surrender some of me, but God, you can't have this part of my life. And we don't sing that out loud because that would get real weird. But sometimes in my life, what I sing is I surrender some. And in this text, though, they surrendered all. They were willing to be completely obedient to what Jesus had asked them to do. Because true success in life is the result of continual and complete surrender to Jesus. You know, if, if I wanted to mail something to you, you know, say I wanted to mail you, you $100 this week. Uh, anybody interested? Yeah, it's not going to happen. Um, but... <laughs> But if I'm going to do that, if I wanted to mail you something, all I would really need would be four pieces of information from you. Like, that would be it. I wouldn't even need your name. I would just need your, your street address, your city, your state, and your zip code. That was all I needed. I could mail uh, anything to you that I wanted. Four pieces of information. Now, that's a big deal. But what if I had 333 pieces of information about you? That's why we ask you to fill out the connection cards every week because we're, we're just gaining more and more information. We want to get it all. Credit card numbers, social security numbers. Uh, we, we want to get all that stuff. I'm kidding. Um, but if someone had 333 pieces of information about you, like if, if I can get to your home with four, like what can I do with 333? You say, Josh, what in the world are you even talking about? In the Old Testament, there are 333 specific prophecies about Jesus being the Messiah. 333, and Jesus fulfilled every one of them. How awesome is that? That God wanted to make Jesus so obvious to all of us that he said, you know what? I'm not just going to give you one verse or two verses or three verses uh, in the Old Testament. I'm going to give you 333 specific passages that refer to Jesus as the Messiah. And we read one of them in Matthew 21, verses 4 and 5. And it says, this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on the colt uh, of the foal of a donkey. This is the second point that God's word is true and can be fully trusted. So God's word is true and can be fully trusted. You know, for me personally, when I'm running on empty, uh, it's God's word that fills me up. Now, I, I love, and I say this often, I love to drive fast. I love it. And for a long time, like I got my first speeding ticket just in October. Um, for a long time, people say, you're going to get a speeding ticket. And I say, no, I'm not. I've never gotten one yet. I've been driving for 30 years and haven't got a speeding ticket, or 25 years, however long it's been. Um, well, I got one one day. It wasn't very fun. It was my fault I was speeding. But now people say, well, you're going to get a speeding ticket. You know what I say? That's okay. I'm going to go to heaven one day. Like, I don't even care. Um, now, if you're a teenager, you can't use that line with your parents because they'll send you there immediately. But, but you know what I've discovered about fast cars? Is they don't go very fast without any fuel. Like, they, they don't go anywhere, in fact, without any fuel. They have to have fuel to go fast. And what I've discovered in my life and in the life of other followers of Christ is that man, when we're slowing down, when things aren't moving as they should be, the, the, the Word of God is fuel for our souls. Like, we can't even move without it. You know, a couple weeks ago, I was having just a really bad day. Just, a, just, a, just an awful day. You ever had one of those days? Like, you just don't even want to get out of bed. It's like the, the weight of the world is, is on you. Like, I was just feeling miserable. I thought, you know, I don't even know if I can do this anymore. Like, it was one of those days I just wanted to get in the car and drive to the desert somewhere and live by myself for a while. And God just kept putting a verse of Scripture in my mind. Joshua 1, 7 through 9. Joshua 1, 7 through 9. And I'm like, God, I don't play the Bible game. Some people play the Bible game, you know, they'll just, I'll sit down in the morning and I open up my Bible and I just read whatever's there and, 
And that's fine, but if, if I were to do that, I'd open it up, and the first passage I would read would be like, Judas hung himself. Close it, and well, I'll start again. And now you go do, and like, go do likewise. No! Like, I'm not going to do that. So I don't play the Bible game. But God just kept pressing these verses into my mind. Joshua 1, 7 through 9. So I pulled out my phone and opened up my Bible app. And, and this is what I read. It says, Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. God was reminding me through his word when I was having an awful day that, hey, you know what? I'm with you. You're not alone. You be strong and be courageous. I've got your back. You trust my word. You follow my word. I am God and I am with you. And what anybody else thinks or what anybody else does doesn't really matter because I am the God who created the universe and I'm on your side. I rediscovered that day that the word of God really is living and active and it really does speak to our soul. It really doesn't bring about healing in, in our lives. Yeah, one more quick survey this morning. How many of you uh, were alive in 1987. Okay. How many of you were not alive in 1987? Wow. You'll have to, to believe me on this. I was 11 years old in 1987. And uh, CNN was trying to get off the ground. They were this uh, fledgling little news network that said, hey, we're going to do 24-hour news. Um, and like, who wants to watch the news for 24 hours? Like, I don't know. But they grabbed this news story out of Midland, Texas. And it was about this 18-month-old girl, uh, baby Jessica. And she fell into a well. How many of you remember baby Jessica? Yeah. 18 months old, she fell into this well that was like 22 feet deep. And it was serious. You know, it, was, it was a big deal. She says today, I was reading about it, she says today she has no recollection of it whatsoever. She's perfectly normal, lives a, lives a great life. Um, but I started thinking about the whole ordeal. For 58 hours, rescue workers worked to get baby Jessica out of the well. And at first, I didn't understand the problem. Like, I wasn't being insensitive. Like, I was 11. I was thinking, she fell into a well, why not just lower the bucket down in there, have her climb up and reel her back up? But as we watched it in school, like everybody was talking about, 58 hours. A bunch of people from all over the United States, they came together... They didn't know each other. They weren't familiar with each other. But they started working together and they were able to rescue her from the well. And I thought, how awesome is that? You know, they had to come up with brand new technology. You know, a group of people who really didn't know each other, who probably didn't even agree with one another on some things, they worked together for the purpose of saving this little girl. You know, nobody showed up. Said, hey, I'm sorry, I can't work with them because I don't like the way they're dressed. I'm sorry, I can't work with them. I know there's a baby girl down there, but I just don't like the music that they listen to, so I can't work with them. People were able to put differences aside because the goal of the mission was greater than their personal comforts or preferences. Like they worked together in order to, to get the baby out of the well. They worked 58 hours. They didn't work for like an hour. You know, sometimes I think that's what we do, especially in church work. And in ministry work, we'll, we'll try something for a little while, and if it doesn't work, we're quitting. You know, like they didn't work for an hour and be like, oh, you know, she's only 18 months old. Come on, how attached are you to her, really? And they didn't do that. They worked, and they worked, and they worked. Think about baby Jessica for a minute. You know, what do you think was going on in her mind? Stuck in that well? Trapped in there? And I don't know about you, um, but I would have been thinking, hey, somebody going to save me? Does anybody even know that I'm down here? Does anybody know what I'm going through? Like they were trying their best to communicate, but, but could you imagine how that would feel? And here's some news. We all have family members and friends that spiritually 
their baby Jessica in the well. And they're crying out for someone to save them. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 that God has placed eternity on the heart of everyone. We have family members and friends. And what I'm suggesting is that we work together like those rescue workers who work to get baby Jessica. Like next Sunday, we're going to put on Easter services where the gospel will be presented clearly. Let's all work together to do whatever it takes to get people here so they can hear the good news of Jesus. Now listen, it's in the text, Matthew 21, 6 through 9. It says, The disciples went and did as Jesus instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of them and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heavens. It's said twice in that one verse. You know, Hosanna, Hosanna means please save. We're saved now. There were crowds of people, hundreds and hundreds of people lying in the road. And what they were saying is save us. Please save us now. And don't miss this. They thought Jesus was a political Messiah. They thought Jesus was Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump or whoever your favorite political person is today. That's who they thought Jesus was. They thought Jesus' goal was very simple, that he was going to come save them from Roman oppression. But don't miss this. Jesus always wants to save us from way more than we want to be saved from. He wants to save us from more than we even realize that we need to be saved from. See, they wanted an earthly kingdom. Jesus wanted them to have an, a, a, an eternal kingdom. They wanted a temporary state. Jesus wanted to give them an eternal home. And this is what I'd say uh, to, to the church today. Maybe you're here and you've never accepted Christ. I would say that today is the day. Because listen, he loves you more than you love you. He has a better plan for you than you have a plan for you. Your vision is way too small a thing to live for. When you have the God of the universe who offered his son, uh, Jesus, and because Jesus gave his life, like you and I can have abundant life here on the earth and eternal life in heaven. And I was thinking every Easter is, is special. But I was really thinking this week, what can we do to solidify our commitment? And I thought all the way back to a series that I preached over a year ago called Difference Maker. And I said two things in that, that I want you, when, when someone asks your friends and family members who's made the biggest difference in their life, I want them to be able to say you. I want them to be able to say your name. I want you to make a difference in the lives of your friends and family members. And the second thing I said is I want you to take a step closer uh, in your personal walk with Jesus. And here's what I believe. If you take a step this week and invite someone to church next week, you can become one of the greatest difference makers in their life. And I guarantee that you will take a step or two closer to Jesus in your relationship. Let's go back through, through the whole service this morning. Will you surrender to God and say, okay, God, I'll do this. I believe in the power of your word. And I'll have the courage to pray Hosanna for my family and my friends. Right now, what I want you to do is just think of the person in your family, in your life, that you're going to invite to church next week. Maybe that's church here at KCC. Maybe it's another church somewhere else. But right now, think about that person. Someone that you know that doesn't know Jesus that you're asking, hey, please save God or save now. And here's what I love about, about our church is that you guys do this. And we do this as, as, as a church so well. For nine years uh, that I've been here, whenever I say, hey, you do whatever it takes to get people here, you do. Like I look out here and, and I'm confident in, in two or three months, this second service is gonna be filled to the, filled to the brim because you guys invite people. You guys do that so well. But listen, next week, don't just invite people. Bring them. 
Inviting them is just telling them. Bringing them is saying, hey, I'm showing up at your house at 9 o'clock next week. Or I'm showing up at your house at 10.30 next Sunday morning. And I'm taking you to church with me. They got breakfast in there. I will eat some breakfast. But you're coming to church with me. Bring them. And I know sometimes you do this and you're so frustrated with people. And you're thinking, like, I've tried. And I just can't save them. I've tried everything I could and, and I just can't save them. You're right. You can't, but God can. You weren't called to save anyone. You were called to plant and to water and bring them to a place where God can save them. So who are you going to believe that God can save next week? Who are you going to believe Hosanna for? Because listen, God didn't put us on this planet to make a point. He put us on this planet to make a difference. And I want us as a body of believers to step out into our community and to begin to make a difference. Because I believe when people meet Jesus, life just gets better. Like it doesn't get easier. It gets better. So we're going to have an invitation today. And some of you here, you need to accept Christ for the very first time. You need to be immersed in baptism. You need to have your sins uh, completely washed away to be filled with the gift of the Holy Spirit in your life. You need that. Life gets better with Jesus. But for everybody else today, I just want you to think about that person or those people that you're praying Hosanna for. I'm going to ask you to stand and I'm going to pray and, and Jeremy and the, and the worship band are going to lead us in the song of Lord, I need you. Who do you know that really needs Jesus in their life? Father God, we're thankful for today. God, we're thankful that you have reached down and saved us from ourselves. We're thankful that your vision and your plan for our life is, is way bigger than ours is. And today, Lord, I just pray that you would help us to live in a constant state of surrender to you. That you'd help us to fully trust uh, your word. And God, that you would give us the boldness and the courage that we need to pray Hosanna for our friends and our family members that don't know you. We thank you for Jesus. And uh, as we celebrate and remember this week, as he was walking to his death, the love that he had for us. So Lord, we need you. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen.